And we're talking about hosting the presence of God. The most important thing about any person is what they believe about God. But if you're a Christian, the second most important thing about you is how you host the presence of God. In John chapter 7, excuse me, John 16, verse 7, he said, Whoever I tell you the truth that it is profitable, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Now, think about that. As a believer, you and I are supposed to be in close fellowship with the Spirit of God. You're a part of the kingdom of God. And that, that kingdom, the Bible says, it's not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. It says that you're to be led by the Spirit of God. Jesus said that that Spirit will teach you about Him, and it will show you all things. A uh, number of years ago, uh, someone wrote a book called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And I, I love it. It's like, get up and just say, Lord, here we go. Holy Spirit, come. Uh, I believe it was John Maxwell that made the little action so popular. Those closest to you determine the level of your success. And he was talking about people. But I always want to tell you, the truth is, the closer you are to the Holy Spirit, the more success you're going to have in your life. I remember, uh, you, you know, the Bible, uh, David wrote this. He said, your spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is good. Uh, I remember uh, a number of years ago, we had a man in church who was filled with the Spirit. And when his wife found out, she wouldn't even sleep in the same bed with him. She says, I'm not sleeping with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> she, and uh, I remember talking to her and I said, hey, look, the Holy Spirit's going to make him a better husband, not a weird one. It's going to make him better. All right, now worse. All right, but the Holy Spirit's going to bring victory, righteousness, peace, joy, never gives up, always advancing, never depressed. I, I love it when Paul is in prison and he writes to the Philippians and he says to them, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, how many of you would, could use some more joy? No. And joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Paul's full of joy, and he's in prison. Right? Uh, but when the Spirit of God is on the inside of us, and we're flowing with him in God's purpose for us, there is joy. Now, one of the things that, as a pastor, I, I come across from time to time is people that are very, very concerned that they have somehow blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, verse 32. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. You know, and this simply in theological terms, people call that blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And there's people like, you know, I, I think I've done that. You know, and they're in fear, they're in guilt, they're under condemnation. But I, I want to help you with this, right? Uh, Jesus said that no one comes to him unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, what happens is God the Father draws people by the Holy Spirit. And anybody who thinks that they've committed the unpardonable sin, and it bothers them because they want to get right with God, they're hungry for God, they obviously have not committed the unpardonable sin because the Spirit of God is drawing them. You will, you will not feel condemnation. You will not feel guilty about sin unless the Spirit of God is, is literally convicting you of sin. And if you've committed the unpardonable sin, he won't do that. I remember before I was born again, I go out on Friday night and sin, and I'd be like, when can I sin next? Hello? But when you get saved, how many know you get ruined for sinning? Because you just think about it, and something on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit, is saying, no, don't go in that direction. 
in John 16. It says, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convince the world of sin, of the availability of God's goodness and deliverance or escape from coming judgment. You know, so, many, so often people think, well, the Holy Spirit, he's just going to bring condemnation on me. In fact, the Holy Spirit never brings condemnation. Condemnation is you're bad, you're no good, God doesn't want you, God's mad at you, God's not going to bless you, God's not going to answer your prayers. That's condemnation. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. Condemnation is a counterfeit of conviction. And conviction is God loves you. Come to God. Notice, he's talking about the, the Holy Spirit... He, he shows us the availability of God's goodness and how we can escape and be delivered from coming judgment. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as David said, is good. Now, I, I mentioned this, uh, I think, last week, maybe the week before, but I just wanted to take a moment and say it again, that God literally hides things. It says it's the glory of God, Proverbs 25, verse 2, to conceal a matter, it's the glory of kings to search a matter out. Colossians 2, 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, but God doesn't hide something from you. He hides something for you. He's hiding it, but he's hiding it so you can find it. How many of you have parents or grandparents, you've ever played hide and seek from your kids or grandkids? Now, you don't hide so they can't find you. Right? You hide so they can find you. In fact, you make sure they can find you. And if they don't, you whistle. Come on, let's wait. <laughs> You're making sure that they find you. Well, God is the same way. Now, things are hidden, but they're not hidden from us. They are hidden for us. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, the King James says, to be filled with the Spirit. Amplified says, but ever be filled. And, and really, it is a continuous tense. It, in, in some translations say it this way. It says, keep on being filled or be being filled. Uh, receiving the Holy Spirit is not something that we do one time and then it's, that's it forever. You say, yeah, but I was filled with the Spirit. Yeah, but you leak. You leak. Right? And so the Bible tells us this isn't something that happens once. It says, be being filled. Now, in Luke 11, Jesus said, when we ask, we receive. And it is something that we need to do daily. We need to be asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, in Acts chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost. The church is born. Peter gets up, begins to preach, and he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days that God will pour out of his spirit on all flesh. Now, let me say this. The last days began on the day of Pentecost. That's when they began. And if those were the last days, these are the last of the last days. He said, but I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out of my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Now, notice the prophecy that Joel gave, which Peter said refers to the church age. He said, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh in the last days. Now, there is a, 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 a segment of Christianity where we refer to, or they refer to themselves, also as the cessationist. And they simply believe that God stopped doing everything supernatural either when the last apostle died or when we received the canon of Scripture right, in the early 4th century. But they say at that point, God really stopped doing all supernatural things. Now, let me simply say that is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, but it... It, it is something that, well, it's, we find it more in America than any place. In fact, you get outside the United States, and well over 80% of everybody who claims to be a Christian says that's, you know, that, that is not true, right? Um, the fact, the largest percentage of that, that group, the sensationists, are in the United States more than anywhere else in the world. 
Of course, uh, we have the Catholics, and they've never gone in that direction. In fact, in fact uh, St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, probably, in fact, uh, he died in the early 5th century. And uh, probably, the, in fact, no doubt, he was the most influential Christian uh, for a thousand years after he died. His book, The City of God, had more impact on Christianity than anything else. And uh, he talked about, he was the bishop in, in Hippo, and he talked about under the, the, his, his ministry how people were just being healed constantly. Right? It wasn't something that, that uh, had ceased. Martin Luther talks about praying for sick friends and seeing them recover. Right? Now, in Jude, which is the second to the last little book of the Bible, right, right before the book of Revelation, he writes, from, he says, Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, but I found it necessary to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Now, notice what Christianity is was delivered how often? For how many? For all. Once for all. And notice he said that you'd have to contend for it. In other words, there will be opposition. There, there will be those who tell you, no, 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 God's not doing that. All those things have passed away. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, Paul is writing to the church, and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Now, it's really interesting where the Bible says not to be ignorant. How many of you know that's where we're the most ignorant? And it literally says, I don't want you to be ignorant about these things because you, can, you do not flow in what you're ignorant about. Right? So in verse 4, he says there's diversities of gifts but the same spirit. In other words, not everybody has the same gift. There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, psalmists. There's people with the gift of exhortation. There's a lot of different gifts. It says, but it's the same spirit. Not everybody's called to do the same thing, but it is the same spirit. All right? There's different ministries, but the same Lord. And then there's diversities of activities. In other words, it will operate the same gift, can operate differently in different people. It's the same gift, it's the same spirit, it's the same Lord, but it operates differently. But it is the same God who works all in all. Now, the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So every believer, God wants there to be at least one of these manifestations of the spirit that will flow through them from time to time. And notice, it is for the profit of all. It's not about the person who the gift is manifest through. It's really for the profit of everybody. It's for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith, or some of your translations will say special faith, by the same Spirit. Now, the word of wisdom is not somebody who's smart or went to school. Right? The word of wisdom is literally when God shows you something that is going to take place. It's in his wisdom. It hasn't taken place yet. Right? You said, I thought that was prophecy. No, that's not what prophecy is. The word of wisdom is when God shows you something in his wisdom that he knows is going to take place. The word of knowledge is when he shows you something supernaturally that is taking place or has taken place, but you could not know it naturally. And we'll, we'll have an example in a little bit. And then it talks about faith, and it's special faith. Right? Uh, everybody knows about Daniel in the lion's den, right? That's special faith. Special faith very often has to do with supernatural protection. And it's not your normal faith. It is a supernatural faith that God drops down on the inside of you. And to another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. Now, notice that both gifts and healings are plural. So it's, it's one gift, but there's a lot of gifts inside the gift. Right? So it's going to operate differently in different people. 
Um, maybe a good example can be found in Acts chapter 8. Right? Now, Philip goes down to the city of Samaria. He preaches Christ to them. And the Bible says, The multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. No blind people, no lepers, many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. You see, it was a gift. You see, when, the, when, when one of the gifts of healing, notice it's gifts, plural, healings, plural. When someone is flowing in a gift, it usually operates in just certain areas. Right? Now, anybody can be prayed for in faith, but when it's one of the gifts of healings, it's usually just certain areas that they will have tremendous success right? because it's a gift. And that's how that gift will flow in that person. Right? Now, it's gifts and it's healings. It's been suggested that there's 39 gifts. Jesus had 39 stripes. It's been suggested there's probably 39 gifts. I don't know how many they are. There might be 200. But the gifts of healings operates differently in different people, but it is the same spirit. And to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues or diverse kinds, again, plural. It's a gift with different types, right? Different kinds of tongues to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all of these, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So how does it happen? It happens as the spirit wills, not as we will. In uh, Hebrews 2 and 4, it says, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders. And if somebody says, what's a sign? It's going to point you to God. What's a wonder? Something that makes you wonder. How many ever had some wonders? Makes you wonder. With various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So somebody who's used in a certain area, they can't say, well, I'm going to do that right now. Because it's not according to your will. It's not according to my will. It's according to his will. All right? So, I'll give you an example. God says to Samuel, he said, I want you to go to Bethlehem, and I want you to anoint one of the sons of Jesse to be king over Israel. Right. Now, he gets there, and Jesse has eight sons, but he only has seven of them there. Right. Now, isn't it interesting that God didn't tell him which son it was going to be? He just said, one of the sons. Right. And the oldest Elib comes and he says, oh, this is the one. And God says, no, 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 I've rejected him. And the next one comes and he thinks, that's the one. And finally, seven of them pass in front of him and, and God says, none of those. And he says to Jesse, hey, don't you have another son? Is this all of them? And he said, well, there's the run. You know, he's out there with the sheep. And he said, well, we're not going anywhere until he comes. And when he came, then the Spirit said to him, this is the one, arise and anoint him. Now, notice it's called the word of knowledge. God doesn't give you knowledge about everything. God didn't say, okay, he's got eight sons. These are their names. These are the ones that I don't want. This is the one that I want. All that God told him was go and anoint the one that I show you. It was just a word of knowledge. Not all knowledge, just a simply a word of knowledge. Uh, the prophet... Elisha has a servant by the name of Gehazi who's been with him for about 20 years. And there is a, the, the, the enemies are the Assyrians, and there is a general in the Assyrian army by the name of Naaman, and he's a leper. And there is a servant girl from Israel who's in his house. And that little girl says, why? 
Why, if Naaman was in Israel, the prophet in Israel would heal him of his leprosy. So he goes and tells the king, and the king sends him to Israel. And he comes with all kinds of gifts. He thinks he's going to buy a supernatural move of God. He ends up at the prophet's house. And the prophet says, go dip seven times in the river Jordan. He's reluctant, but eventually he goes. He dips seven times in the river, comes back, and his skin is like a baby's skin. He's perfectly healed. So he tries to give the prophet a bunch of gifts. And he says, no, no, I won't take anything. He said, well, then please just let me be able to take back two mule loads of dirt. How many know that's a kind of strange request in our thinking? Give me two mule loads of dirt. Now, here was why. Because at that time, they believed each god had a certain territory that they were god over. And he figured, well, the God of Israel is just God in Israel, so I need some Israel dirt. I'm going to take my dirt home, all right, so I can worship God. So he says, go. Well, Gehazi, his servant, says, look, my master has spared that Naaman. I mean, he's come with millions and millions of dollars. I'll go after him. So he goes and chases Naaman down. And, and he says, hey, two prophets, two young prophets have just come. And, uh, the, and, and Elisha said it would be great to receive something from them. So could, could I have like a half a million dollars for each one and some clothes? And he says, great, have twice as much. Gives him the money. He takes off, has the people carrying it for him. He hides it. Right? And uh, then he goes in to where Elisha is. And uh, the prophet says to him, he says, uh, where have you been? And he said, well, your, sin, your servant did not go anywhere. And he said, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from the chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money, to receive clothing? And then he actually tells him what he's planning to spend it on. Olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants. Now, He'd been with the prophet for 20 years. This is what he knew. He knew the prophet did not know every time somebody lied, cheat, and stole. He thought, I can get away with this, right? But as the Spirit wills, the gift of the Spirit manifested, and he saw supernaturally something happening in another place, right? Now, if, if the prophet had known about everybody who was cheating and lying and stealing, he would have known. And he'd have said, man, if I do this, I'm going to get caught. But he believed he could get away with it. Because the manifestations of the Spirit, when that anointing is on somebody and they're, they've got a certain call or an office, that doesn't mean it's in manifestation all the time. In fact, again with Elisha, he's with the king of Israel, the king of uh, I believe it's Moab, or it might be Edom, and King Jehoshaphat. And they're in the desert. And they've ran out of water. Everybody thinks they're going to die. And they go to the prophet. They go to Elisha. And this is what he says. Now bring me a musician. And it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Or the anointing came upon him. Now, he didn't have that anointing on him all the time. Right? But when the musician played... The anointing, the hand of the Lord came on him, and he prophesied, and he said, make this place full of ditches, because thus says the Lord. And when they filled it with ditches, God put water in it. The enemy saw it, a reflection, it looked like blood, and they came, and they literally defeated the enemy. But what I wanted you to see is he did not have that anointing to prophesy, to give them God's wisdom all the time. It was when the musician played that that began to happen, right? Now, how many of you realize that parked cars never break any driving laws? All right? But they're going nowhere. They're accomplishing nothing. They're, they're not fulfilling their purpose. They make no mistakes, but they are paralyzed. Right? Somebody said this, you spell faith R-I-S-K. Hello? R-I-S-K. Right? It's a risk. It's a risk. Right? Now, Romans 5. 
Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. All right? When we're driven by love, it is impossible to stay stationary. When you're driven by love, it's impossible to stay stationary. For God so loved the world that he, he gave, right? And, and literally, the Holy Spirit works in us, in our hearts, when our hearts are turned towards him, right? And, and it's that love, that compassion. Again and again, you'll read in the scripture where Jesus is moved with compassion. He's moved with compassion. And when that compassion rises up, he would move, he would heal, he, he fed multitudes, right? And w- the, that same compassion, that same love, the Bible says, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think it's interesting, you know, we pray for the Holy Spirit and we say, Holy Spirit, come. And when he shows up, we say, go in the back, sit down and be quiet. Right? He challenges us. He challenges us. Noah was challenged when God told him to build an ark. Abraham was challenged when God told him to leave his country and go to an unknown destination. Jonah was challenged when God told him to go preach to the people of Nineveh, the enemies, the greatest enemy of Syria. Mary was challenged when God told her that she as a virgin would bear a son who'd be the savior of the world. Ananias was challenged when Jesus told him in a a vision, go and pray for Saul, the greatest persecutor of the church. Peter was challenged when God told him to go to Cornelius' house and share the gospel with a group of Gentiles, something that was against his cultural upbringing. But all of those challenges ended up when there was obedience bringing a tremendous blessing. And very often when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, there's a challenge. There's a challenge. Now, let me, let me close with this in, in Genesis 3 and verse 14. Thir- excuse me, Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him. Now, God had been told him already. Don't bring your relatives. Separate from them. Separate from them. But he had Lot with him. And I think it's interesting that God literally gives Abraham his second greatest blessing when he obeyed what God had told him. He said, lift up your eyes now and look. From the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Oh, and let me just remind you, where Abraham is standing is what is called the West Bank today. The land that more than anyone in the United States forced Israel to give up. He was standing there and God said, I'm giving this to you, to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then your descendants also will be numbered. Arise and walk in the land and the length of it and go through it, for I give it to you. But when did that blessing come? When did God speak? When he obeyed what God had spoken to him. I just want to say something. There is always a blessing in obedience. There's always a blessing in obedience. What happens through disobedience? We grieve the Holy Spirit and so often miss things that God wants to bless us with. Thank you for watching and being a part of our online family. Subscribe to our channel for access to all of our videos and live services. You can also be notified when a new service becomes available if you ring the notification bell. We cannot do this without you. You can support this ministry and help us reach more people with the word by giving at reslife.org give. Thanks again for watching. Be blessed.